make sure that I'm on. Recording. Okay, uh, we are now recording. Welcome everyone to the October 20th, 2020 building committee meeting. It's good to see you all. I wish it were in person, but um, our, our last meeting was March 4th, 2020. And um, times are really different. We've discovered that our buildings were not made um, to meet the demands of COVID-19. And um, they're really holding us back from getting more of our students um, back in, into our classrooms in person. So there really is a new urgency to our charge. And the build, building committee charge is to review the needs of the assessment report, determine priorities, determine the size and scope of a future building project and bond, and then make a recommendation to the school board. Normally we would do, that's Terry, Normally, normally we would do introductions, but we have so many people and it's, it would be really hard to do that. So um, names are up on the boxes and um, we, we won't take the time to do introductions tonight. So uh, Heather, do you want to do the review of the strategic plan? And I'll take over letting people in. Um, yes. And I misplaced Michael. I left him downstairs quickly. Um, so you my apology for that. Did you want me to go over the goals, Donna? Was that the plan? Yeah. Okay. Do I need 30 seconds. I left him downstairs. Okay. I'll read the first one while she's gone. Um, health and well being. Our schools will provide a supportive learning environment in which physical, social, and emotional well being are valued and promoted. And these are the, the district goals as developed by the Cape Elizabeth School Department uh, School Board for the strategic 2020 through 2025 strategic plan. And these were developed and approved on September 25th, 2019. So Heather, are you back? So I read health and well-being. Okay. I'm still trying to find them. Why don't you just keep going if you have okay. them in front of you? I can't find them. This one is yeah. competency. Our students will be personal, personally responsible, aware, empathetic, and engaged local and global citizens. Multiple pathways and definitions of success. Our schools will value, promote, and celebrate multiple pathways and definitions of success. Safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. Our schools will be safe and effective facilities. They will be updated and maintained to meet the needs of students and staff in accordance with long-term financial planning. And the last one is environmental responsibility. The school department will prioritize environmental responsibility, including stewardship and sustainability. Okay, great. Um, Donna, we have a question coming in that usually whenever we have a meeting, we have the opportunity for public comment. Do we wanna do that right now? Quickly, it's not on the agenda, but um, I think it's important to hear from the public. Is that okay? Um, that, that's fine with me as long as we can get to our agenda. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll keep track of the time. Um, so if there's any comments from the public, just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, I am not seeing any. Oh, I, John. John, I see John Bolt, he's raising his physical hand. Go ahead, John. You're on mute, so you have to unmute yourself, John. There we go. Thank you. So, um, yes, I, I don't mean to be extensive. I just wanted to comment on some of the materials that were presented for the meeting, specifically with regards to the enrollment forecasts. Um, I was glad to see that those were done. 
I would note that there are a couple of things about the enrollment forecasts and having looked at the numbers very carefully myself uh, in the past. If you look at what the shape of the class growth has been over the last 20 plus years, um, you'll see that class sizes tend to grow about on average about 20 to 25 students between kindergarten and fourth grade and then declines about around four students or so between eighth grade and 12th grade. And I'm looking at the forecasts for the flat um, uh, growth of the, or mostly flat growth of the enrollment. And I think they're actually underestimating the uh, initial growth in the class sizes and then underestimating a little bit because there tends to be a little bit of decline in the high school years. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to uh, note that I, I have the data. I'm happy to provide that to folks. Um, I would also note we should expect a, a drop in enrollment in about four years because we're going to have an economic uh, downturn and that's going to likely affect birth rates. Um, and uh, countervailing that, we may see an increase in population as people are leaving urban areas to more rural areas like this one. So in the long run, though, when you're looking at the facilities, we've got a couple of large factors that could have the population go up a a fair bit and down a fair bit from the steady numbers where we've been at, we really ought to be thinking about, as we build out our facilities, getting an estimate of that population that's not just a point estimate, but really is an estimate of what's the range, because the cost of not handling what your expected range is, is actually what gets expensive if you're too big or too small for the expected level of changes that you've got. So I would just urge an, another very hard look at what the um, expected enrollment is, particularly in light of um, the growth that, that this region and Cumberland County and rural areas are experiencing today. That's all, thank you. All right, thanks, John. Um, so moving on to the agenda, unless there's other hands raised. I didn't see any. Um, so we're on to number four. Do you want to go ahead, Donna? Report on facilities work completed. I guess it's sure. Perry. Yes, Perry was going to do um, some, obviously some work has been done on our building since March. Um, we've had the uh, revolving innovation grant going. We've had a lighting project going. Um, we had some ventilation work done. So Perry, I'm, I'm going to, Perry's been busy. I'm going to turn it over to you. I, I'm going to try to share my screen. It wouldn't let me log in as an administrator earlier. Okay, wait a minute. I have to let you um, yeah, host. Okay, you should be able to share now. All right, let me take a look here. It's nothing nothing real exciting. It's more, uh, you can just read along, read along with me. Can everybody see that? Um, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, so at the high school, um, I, some of this has been, been projects that have come up um, throughout the summer, uh, whether it be like an emergency style project, some of these are, are CIP, it, it's really a mix, but this is a, a general where, where we are today. Uh, we did a continued window replacement and wall repair in seven classrooms at the high school. Uh, we installed new carpet and cove base in the occupational therapist workspace. Uh, we, we are in the process, it's ongoing, with installing a new phone server, uh, a new system server in the high school. Uh, we completed a main LED lighting project, which was just about 500 fixtures throughout the high school. Uh, reinstated an existing ventilation exhaust system, along with adding 14 diffusers in the hallways. Upgraded to the uh, public address system as part as the SRRF funding. Um, we are in the process of upgrading our HVAC automation control front end, which is basically just, it's not a lot of mechanical moving parts. It's more of just the computer end of the uh, automation control system, but it, it is big in allowing us to make uh, changes within the system accurately and timely. A uh, temporary wall built for the main office to accommodate an extra space for the school nurse due to the COVID. Addition, uh, let's see, addition of multiple plexiglass barriers. Uh, 
um, hand sanitizer dispensers in every classroom, and the installation of hallway CO2 monitors. Um, that right now is just at the high school. We may be tackling some in Pond Cove in the middle school. I got to evaluate that yet. In the middle school, we've replaced a six inch heating valve in the main boiler room. That valve was responsible for a, a shutdown of the heating system last year as it, as it failed and caused a, a unit to freeze over our walk-in cooler and, and flooding a portion of the kitchen. Uh, the new bleacher reinforcement installed in the gymnasium, that is basically where the bleacher is attached to the wall. Um, due to an inspection, they had found that the reinforcements that hold the back end of the bleachers was at the end of its life. So they added reinforcement to those uh, bleacher installations. Uh, we installed a second sink in the nurse's office in the middle school. We are we're still in the pro process of resetting the failing precast window sills. Those were called out in the Colby report um, because of water infiltration getting into those classroom spaces. Uh, installation of an eight foot fence around the generator. I'm not sure why I put that in. It was a project we did, but not really in reference to the building. <laughs> uh, HVAC automation controls. Again, it's a front end that will also, you'll also see it in Pond Cove. It's basically district wide. We're adding uh, updated controls to the HVAC. And let's see, additional plexiglass barriers as well. Hand sanitizer in every classroom. And we have just completed on Sunday the replacement of a 50 year old fire hydrant. I only put that in there because of the age of that hydrant, that hydrant failed. That was a $12,000 job that was unexpected, um, but we were in a situation where it needed to be done. Uh, we, we weren't able to completely shut off water with it leaving it the way it was. So, and that if, when, when, you, when you shut the water off, I, I learned this, this week, but when you shut the water off in the middle school in Pond Cove, you're also shutting off the water to the fire station and police station. Um, so that needed to be repaired. In Pond Cove, we have an additional office space that was built in, in a hallway alcove. That's kind of a common theme that we're seeing now with uh, running out of space in our buildings, kind of converting uh, alcoves into offices. A uh, new carpet and cove base installed in the conference room. Again, the HVAC automation controls, plexiglass and hand sanitizers. In the future, uh, we have a replacement of the middle school walk-in cooler and freezer. That was damaged in a flood last year. So we're just waiting for the final details of that project to get done. And we're looking to schedule that sometime uh, during the holiday break. Uh, boiler room stack repairs at the middle school. Um, that's just replacing some stacks due to moisture damage. Uh, continued security enhancements and the SRRF building project will be continued as we move from winter into spring. <clears throat> uh, did you want me to share? I did do some drawings of the roofing as well or? Sure. Back at our last meeting in March, um, I was asked about some drawings for the, to, to be able to show what roofs have, have been completed recently and, and which are dated. And to the best documentation I have, these are, these are just pictures, uh, Google pictures. You can find it on Google Maps and, and investigate it yourself. But this is the middle school area over here. Wait, Perry, we can't see. We still have your list up. Let me see if I can back that out. <clears throat> I'm going to break it back up. Are you able to see it now? No, I don't see you not sharing your screen right now. You have to go back to, okay, now, now it says, okay, there you go. We see okay. it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a little more sense now when I'm talking about it. 
Uh, this is the, the middle school building that we have here. Everything that I have outlined in red with the red striping is a newer roof that has been done. And you can tell just simply by the gray color of the roof. Um, that's basically showing a newer rubber where the black rubber is, is more of a dated look to it. Um, but yes, anything here in red striping has been replaced. This is the 30s building here. We just did that roof over the summer. That is a shingled roof. Um, the, the areas here and here and here that are light gray, the only reason they look light gray is because they are, uh, the rooftop is covered with a ballast, which is basically river stone. It's kind of an older way of doing, doing rooftops. The river stone holds the rooftop down. So that's why that has a gray look as well, but that is a dated roof. And then down here at Pond Cove, you have the fourth grade, the kindergarten, and kind of the main lobby area have newer roofs. So it's, you know, it's for the most part, I'd say split right down the middle as far as rooftops that have been done and rooftops that still need to be changed out. And then it is the same thing at the high school. Uh, you have the, uh, the math wing, social studies, English area, and the main lobby area have all been done. And then in the industrial arts wing back here, uh, what we call the C section in the building. Everything else has a dated roof. This portion here does not count as part of the school project only because it is the swimming pool, which is a town owned building. And, and that rooftop would come out of town budget. So that is it. Any questions? Mary, can you, um, can you, I know we're just in the planning stages, but can you talk a little bit about um, the, the next phase here with our uh, federal grant? We just got um, an additional, uh, a grant for an additional million dollars and we need to spend a lot of that on, hopefully on doing some ventilation work. Can you? Just talk about that a bit. Sure. I, when, when I was notified that we received this extra funding, I, I just, I decided to contact Colby Company and say, you know, you guys have done the report and and you know our our ventilation system, uh, the most. So uh, how can we get the most bang for our buck with with those funds? Where where can we put the money where we'll do the most good uh, given the current pandemic? And uh, with that, they came back with the report and then we're looking at basically, it would be a change out, I believe of, and James can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost every large air handler that we have in all three schools, um, whether it be an air handler in a mechanical space or a rooftop air handler, um, all the big units would be getting changed out. Uh, rooftops are a little more, simplified because you literally can just you know if the if the units are uh, for the most part a direct match you can pull the old unit off the rooftop with a crane and drop the new one right in place and and hook up the plumbing and electric and you're good to go um the and and, and part of the thing that helps us out as well is our because of the date dating of our air handlers we can only go up to about a, a merv 8 which is a, a a rating system they give filtration. And I don't know if, uh, if anybody else has seen, but they give, uh, the CDC has been giving guidelines and, and uh, env environmental uh, protection agency have been suggesting a MERV 13, which is a higher filtering style filter. Our air handlers currently, most of them, uh, currently cannot handle an air filter like that because the, the units just do not have the power. It would be, it would almost be as like putting something solid behind a fan and, and you defeat the purpose because the air then coming out isn't as strong. Uh, with, with the upgrade of these air handlers, we would uh, I then allow to go up to a MERV 13 filter and meet those recommendations set by the guidelines that were given uh, along with an increased airflow and, and, and other things as well. So it, it, for an overall project, it's affecting all three schools. In, in large portions of the areas. Um, the high school classrooms, most of them are handled by unit ventilators, but after Jeff, Shed, and myself have done a, 
a great bit of, bit of studying those classrooms very well and in detail, all those seem to be meeting the guidelines and the recommendations set um, actually from their the build uh, date, meeting, meeting the, the, the CFM that we need for those spaces. That's it. Anybody have any questions for Perry? I don't think I can see you all. So if, if you have a question, just shout it out. It looks like Tim Thompson has a question, Donna. Oh, okay, Tim. Well, there's Tim, okay. So, so Donna, so we've got this million dollar grant to do what, Barry, what, do what Perry has identified with Colby. Uh, how much of that million dollars would that, uh, would that take up the bulk of that? I, I have no idea how that much- would that, be, that would be approximately 100,000, yeah, six hundred thousand um, dollars. The kicker is it has to be um, spent by December thirty first. So has that order been put in place yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank we, you. Are, we are work trying to work fast. <laughs> it, it, it's a little it's a little tricky, and uh, we're trying to get creative with how that process can get done, um, and. And, and seeing what uh, Marcy's also working on pulling strings to see what we can do with the state. And if there is any way that we can have those funds either set aside or, or extended a little bit longer for us. It, yeah. it's, it's happening all across the state. Well, uh, it, it's a federal grant and they're setting the guidelines. So yeah. there's, there's um, little to no hope of getting that extended, but we're hoping that we can encumber the amount. Um, it also, means most likely that um, if we can get it up and running, it will have to be done with our students in the building. So that's gonna be a little tricky as well, but um, it's a lot of money and I can't see that we're gonna have that much money in, in the near future um, to do this project. So um, we, we want to get our students and staff back into our schools safely and this is a way we can do it. So we're gonna try everything we can do to make it happen. Perry, can I quickly just follow up? Sure. So you said something about um, the ability of taking these new air handlers and um, would, did you say something about being able to put them on if we ended up having to build new buildings, would these air handlers just go in the trash or would we possibly be able to reuse them? And the I, there's always a possibility to reuse them. Uh, it's a little too early to tell because a, a, a new building or renovation, uh, whatever is decided here, has not been designed yet. So um, we, we don't know for sure. But uh, you know, if you have a, if you have a, oh, I'm going to say a five ton. It's just a, a size that will give it a five ton unit sitting on on a rooftop. And the design calls for in a new building or a new renovation calls for a five ton unit very similar or the same on the rooftop of the new portion. Then you, yes, you could literally just pull that one off and set it in place on the new building. It, it's really of, and, and that's one thing that could be con taken into consideration when the design is done as well. You, using those units and, and trying to get our most money back on them. But it, it, to, to answer your question, it's too early to say, you know, that they'll all get used, but I, I'd say we could definitely probably use a good portion of them. Thanks. I was just wondering if it was even possible. Yeah. And right, right now we have the immediate concern of trying to um, get the air quality as good as possible to get our students and staff back into our school safely. So um, we know that if we do any projects, building projects, it'll it'll be probably a couple of years before um, it gets on the road. And so between now and then, we we have to have people back in our schools. So so this is a good chance to do that. Any other questions for Perry? We've learned a lot about ventilation since <laughs> August. Oh, Lisa, I have. <laughs> Oh, okay. So 
Um, we're going to move on to the um, the enrollment projection. And um, Marcy and I started looking into this early, um, soon after our last, our, our March 4th meeting, and um, looked at a couple different companies. This was done by the New England School Development Council called NESDEC, and um, they regularly do um, enrollment projections for school districts in New England. So um, this is one of the things that they do. Um, Thank you, John, for um, talking about this. I'm just, I don't know if you have, I think I'm going to try to share my screen now and pull that up. I'm not sure how large it will come out. So, um, Jamie, you have a question? Is it for Perry? And nope, it's about the enrollment stuff. Sure, go ahead. So while you're pulling that up, Donna, I wonder um, the information that was included uh, seemed like a lot of raw data, but not necessarily context. And so as you're going through this, I just wondered if there's additional context about what the factors were that led to this data and the so, methodology yeah, and so, so on. We had to, and Marcy, you might want to chime in on this because I know you were the one that you were the contact with the company, but they asked for a lot of information which we provided um, about the district. And then this is the standard projections that they do for um, New England school districts that, that ask for it. So Marcy, do you want to talk any about the questions that they asked? Um, yes, you're right, Donna. It was it was comprehensive in the sense that they went with um, growth in, in the town, the areas, Jamie, um, <laughs> complete, you know, and like I had to get information from the assessor's office. It was a lot of information from the schools. We had to get data, right? Wasn't that right, Donna? Data from, uh, I believe it was 20 years worth of growth data that they were looking at from historical purpose. Um, and I'd have to look back through my emails too to get to to bring up to the top of my mind some of the other things. But it took us quite a while to gather everything together for them. I don't I don't mean to put you on the spot, and I don't want to derail the conversation. But if if any of that's available, I I personally would love to take a look at it um, just to see again yeah, sure. what the what the component factors were, if there was any weighting um, placed on any of those things, and. Um, yeah. it, it sounds like it was more than just historical averages overlaid with, with birth rate trends, which is good, but I, I'd, I'd love to see um, sort of the, the depth of variables there in particular. I was just going to say that, Jamie, they definitely did more than just laying the live yeah. births over the trends. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so sure, particularly Jamie, anything I relating, particularly anything relating to, you know, the composition of the current demographic in town, real estate transactions, um, and projected um, uh, sort of market demand um, for for property availability, things like that. So yep, sure. I'll um, I'll go through my files and do some digging and uh, pull up the work that we had to send to them. And as far as the um, behind the scenes, some of the things I'd have to actually ask them for what they did in their calculations on their end. So our end will be easy, but I can also ask them as well, Jamie, and get back to you. Thank you. Welcome. So as I said, they this is something that they do for schools um, throughout New England. It's a very respected um, organization that they do a lot of different things for schools. Um, so um, this is just the historical enrollment. So you can see uh, where we started in 2004 uh, with 17, uh, 1,708 students. and. Uh, last year and this year we were um, last year we were um, up to 1575 um, downward trend of minus 7.8 percent and an interesting thing about this and I know this came up in our last meeting as I was listening to it um, today 
uh, with the grade combinations. Um, and so we would look at the K to four and to see what that looked like for Ponco, five to eight for the middle school and then nine to 12 for, um, for the high school. And then they, they gave the data just in bar graph form, the same data. And then these were the projected enrollments. And again, um, they gave the grade level combinations down here. Um, so you can see um, what would the needs and changes would be for each of the different schools. Um, going from the Enrollment going from uh, 15 point, uh, 1575 into 1920 to 1581 projected enrollment for 2029 30. And then if I can move you all over, and that is um, a projected growth of 0.4%. And you have this packet. So let's see if I can move this. Yep, there we go. And again, in the next page is in bar graph form. This is the historical data compared really with the projected uh, enrollment data. into 2029. And then this is a sort of comparison of the um, birth, birth rate, births, and um, the projected kindergarten enrollment. So you can see in 2004, those were the students that entered kindergarten in 2009, um, using our data up to 2000, those born in 2014, um, entered kindergarten in 2019. And then the last page is the projection for New England as a whole. And as I said, they do this, these projections for for all of schools in all over New England. So um, they have data. So it looks like Maine will be um, is a minus 6%. Uh, so 6% decrease. Although that doesn't show that for our district. So, does anybody have any comments after looking at this? Anybody? Hope. Hi, thank you. Um, I think this is sort of the elephant in the room a bit, but things have changed in the last six months. And I think to what extent are we able to take that into account? Because I think we all know that there's, there, there could be a dramatic change in what the projections are for the population in the state or, or the town. So I don't expect anybody to have a, an easy answer to that, but it's certainly something we need to keep in mind. I feel like Hope is making a really good point because I mean, I'm hearing that real estate's going crazy with people trying to move here and not just Maine, but here. So um, we've always been a popular, uh, I like to call us North Connecticut as opposed to Cape Elizabeth, but I think it's getting even more popular. And I don't know how we keep track of that. Just to follow up, I mean, I, I don't think we can make any projections based on that, but I, I think it would be naive for us not to take it into account and just sort of work with the with the study because things have obviously changed dramatically. Uh, 
Other comments? Jen, I see you raising your hand. And then Marianne will take you afterwards. So oh, I was looks like Jen. Um, I was just wondering if this, so is this the final enrollment study that we would use to design new school buildings or is it, was this just sort of a study to help us inform this decision better? Well, when we left in <laughs> March, um, it was requested that we do another study. So we, this is what, um, that's what we did at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I was also just, I mean, it went to 2029. That doesn't, yeah. are they able to forecast longer? Like that would be like a realistic lifetime of our, our school buildings, of a new school building. Hope, yeah, like 30. Uh, no, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be the lifetime of the new school building, but that's as far out as they would, they would go at this point, so. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. Marianne, did you have a hand raised? You have to unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So thank you very much for uh, doing this, Donna. I really appreciate it. I was just looking today at your study, and then I tried to look and see what else is out there in the universe. And there's actually a um, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston study for Northern New England that came out in September of this year. And it says that it is projecting that Cumberland County school age children, um, the population will drop by 16.9% between 2017 and 2030. So I think there's a big discrepancy between what the Federal Reserve Bank is looking at and what we're looking at. And I just raise it as a question and I know also the governor's office had done a study in 2016 and concluded that the numbers were going to go down. So I'm just a little bit concerned given that we have seen a 20% drop in the school population since about 2007 to today um, that I'm wondering if this is overly optimistic to be projecting an essentially flat population. Well, this is specific to Cape Elizabeth. So, you know, that's, that's about all we can tell you at this point. So, you, you know, okay. trying to compare New England as a whole. Um, yeah, this was Cumberland yeah. County. So I'll send this to you. I, you know, I was just looking at your information today and looking for other information. So I can send you this uh, link because it is for Cumberland County. How old is that study, Marian? It was published September 15th, 2020. So that wasn't the 2016 study? No, there's also a state study that is 2016, but the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston was September 15th, 2020. So I'll send Donna the link tomorrow. Sure. Thank you. So Heather, you were going to go over the uh, the four options just to remind us. Yep. Right. So um, the engineer and um, architect company came up with four potential options for us. I think I can try to pull them up. And we've already had a lot of discussion um, about these four options. Um, next on the agenda is to, um, you know, is to see is there one that, you know, most people are comfortable taking off and narrowing it down to three options, or is there, you know, a way to narrow down two option to two options? That will be the next thing coming through, but. Um, Option one is a phase lower school and middle school building replacement. It's a 10 year project. Um, it comes in two phases. 
Uh, phase one is the new building construction adjacent to the middle school to be temporarily occupied by Pond Cove Elementary School. Um, with the existing cafetorium and gym remaining in place, um, the Pond Cove Elementary School would be um, demolished um, and the occupation would be 2023. This estimated phase bond is between 33, 39 million and 43 million. Phase two, oh. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Phase two um, would be the, um, the second new building, the construction of the Pond Cove Elementary School in its current location. A new gym and a new cafetorium would be built in the spare space. Lower school students would occupy the new space. Middle school students would occupy the new phase one school. Um, and occupation would take place in 2033. This estimation is 42 million to 46 million, um, which are on the bottom there. Um, so that was option one. Option two, is the current lower school and middle school building replacement. So it's the same as option one, but it's over a four year period. And my recollection and going back and reviewing and understanding is that it's the similar idea, but it's just done faster. Um, there's phase one, the occupation would be done by 2023, but phase two occupation, ocu patient would be in by 2024. This option we would replace both Pond Cove and the middle school over a four year period. Renovations to the Cape a little, um, and then all through all of these, there's renovations happening to the high school to help prolong the high school's life. Um, there's an economy of scale by executing both projects under one town bond. And this option would require the town to support a larger bond. It would be um, 71 to $77 million for the two buildings together at the same time. Option number three is to frame off restoration and renovation of, low, of existing lower and middle schools. So the temporary relocation of lower and middle school students will be required. 40 portables, um, which we talked about last time as being quite expensive. Uh, a temporary gym and cafetorium will be needed to provide once renovations are um, on existing the start. Uh, estimated occupation, would be roughly the same time, summer of 2024. Now this is probably all gonna shift a little bit, these estimated timing, cause we're, we had a little pause, a six month pause in all of this. Um, the cost of the portables, as I mentioned above, are um, 2 million for 12 months occupancy, um, 3 million for 18, um, 18 months occupancy. Um, and remember this quote doesn't include the electricity, the heat or the IT or water, it's just for the portables. Um, and the rental costs um, included in estimated bond size. So those, those costs for the portables would be included. No, not um, included. Not included, you're right, not included, thank you. Current estimated real estate combination value of Pond Cove and Cape Elizabeth Middle School is $28 million. That estimated bond to do those two would be 53 to $58 million. And then we have option four, which is um, the security and cafetorium upgrades. Um, this is the most basic work that we can do. It'll address the security concerns. Um, back when we were having all these conversations, there was a lot of talk, I'm just reminding everyone that there was a lot of talk around um, the entrances to buildings and potential active shooters and, and, and the fear of the entrance to our buildings not being safe enough. And so there was a lot of, this needs to be dealt with immediately. What can we do to make these buildings safer? Um, and I just, so um, that's where this is coming from. And the, the whole 
conversation originally years ago when I was involved with it, got started with a cafetorium um, between, you know, Pond Cove and the middle school not being um, effective or um, providing the space and the needs um, of, of a healthy eating experience. Um, it, it's completely inadequate. And since then we've learned through all of the information of other things such as the band room, for example. I know Caitlin Ramsey is here tonight, but that's just one example. So this was just, I think, going back to the original, original concerns of security and cafetorium upgrades. It'll address the security concerns of the front entrance and cafetorium to Pond Cove um, Elementary and the Cape Elizabeth Middle School. The construction would take place in the summer of 2022. Not sure if that's still accurate, but this is what we knew at the time. Uh, and occupation is for fall 2023 or spring 2024. Um, the standalone cafetorium structure could remain in place should further construction occur, meaning if we decide to redo buildings around it, we would, they, um, the architects and engineers did sort of do a rough to outline to maintain that space that is brand new. Um, so that wouldn't have to be redone if the rest of the building was redone later. Um, relocations of students would not be necessary during this project. The estimated bond size would be 26 million to 29 million. So hopefully that refreshes everybody's mind. Um, do we wanna open it to discussion at this point, Donna? Um, I think it would be a good idea for the principals now to talk about their smaller spaces. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, um, I think Perry, stop sharing. Um, Perry showed this um, chart uh, at the last meeting, which shows all of the new programs and um, requirements from 1900 on and uh, how the uh, mandates have increased and we need, we have come to need many spaces. One of the things that we're dealing with now is um, many of those um, small spaces where um, we had some uh, speech people working and um, our different specialists, um, we've had to move them out because they were working in closets and there's no ventilation. So we had to, um, to move those teachers and their students out of those spaces. So we've had to move them into either empty classrooms that have been made empty because we, have, we might have a teacher who's teaching remotely uh, so there was um, a bit of moving around of people trying to find spaces uh, for those people. So um, Jeff, I think you can share. I set you up to share. So why don't you share your screen and start with the high school? Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about that. So I just did a quick spreadsheet um, of some spaces that we've become aware of, particularly um, given our current situation. There are, so there's two special education teacher classrooms that were essentially created during the last renovation. Um, one of those spaces has ventilation, the other does not. Um, so the other one currently we've, moved the function. It's now functioning as an office for an individual uh, service provider, but it's not functioning as a classroom. There's another space which is special for a special education teacher. Um, it does have ventilation, um, uh, but it, it's essentially a former conference room space that we converted on the second floor into a, into a sort of an inner inner uh, special education classroom. Our school psychologist is in office off the library hallway. She's currently not working there. Um, she actually is working from the one of from one of these two special education teacher classrooms, the one that doesn't have ventilation, but it's it's bigger anyway, and she can keep the door open, but there's no ventilation in, in her 
office officially. We have two school social workers, neither of them right now is working uh, from their offices because of ventilation issues in both places. One of the offices is next to the school psychologists on the library hallway. The other one is in what used to be a storage space in the math wing. Um, our student-driven learning teacher is a small space. It actually does, it's, an, it's sort of an odd shaped space, but it's a, it's a usable space in terms of ventilation. It's being used this year um, because we didn't, we weren't able to rehire um, the reconstructed student-driven learning teacher position. So it's now being used for our ELL teacher because her designated office space doesn't have ventilation. Um, there's a speech and language teacher who is in a, um, what used to be a storage space off of the library, opposite the school social worker and school psychologist spaces. Um, and she just is in there and she's permitted to have one or two kids at most in her space. Um, our college counselor is in a small, um, uh, small office without windows. It's not a terrible space, but it's a small office without windows. Um, she's currently working in a location where our academic skills staff used to work. Um, we moved the academic skills staff because they tend to work with a few more kids um, than a college counselor at any given time. We moved them down to a classroom of a teacher who's um, teaching 100% remotely now. Um, our school resource officer uh, works from a small office down, um, uh, I, I think it used to be a storage space primarily. Um, it's, it's just to the left as you enter the, the doors at the bottom of the amphitheater that go towards the gym and, and theater. Um, our OTPT space, we had to relocate that one. Um, it had been in a, uh, a large space, but a completely unventilated space that was originally designed for storage. So we've now temporarily put her in the, and, and uh, some of the exercise equipment that she uses um, in the teacher's lunchroom because teachers aren't allowed to use the lunchroom for lunch um, just because of social distancing issues. Um, the ELL teacher is currently, um, in one of the other spaces that's been opened up because of 100% uh, remote learning teachers. She had been designated to be in a small space um, that's between two science classrooms on the top floor, but because of ventilation issues there, um, we, uh, we moved her to, a, to another location. Uh, we have been lucky, not, not, I mean, unlucky in a way, lucky in another way. Um, the fact that we do have teachers who for health reasons are teaching 100% remotely has given us some flexibility to move people around away from unventilated spaces. And then I just noted the athletic department suite, which, is, um, which has always been undersized. Um, it's a small office for the athletic director and a small adjoining office by um, the athletic administrative assistant. I mean, ideally they would definitely have more space than they do. So those are the spaces that occurred to me, Donna, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we're just trying to show um, as a result of the all of these mandates, um, all of the small spaces that have been added to, um, to, to our needs in the past several years. Troy, do you want to talk about your school? Sure. I, I think you can share. All right. Hmm. Not seeing it. How is it? Oh, wait a minute. Uh, it looks like it was going to let me, but um, I don't really see where it is hiding. All right, wait. I'm going to withdraw and then try to get you up and going again for some reason. And I had shared it with you earlier too, so maybe you could do it too. Okay, there we go. You should be all set. All right, let me see here if I can do it. All right, I'm still not seeing my screen. I don't really need to share it anyways. I know what I'm talking about. All right, I think I can share it. Yeah. 
So for us really, uh, and I can talk about it while Donna's trying to, sh I did share it with her earlier today. It's really just basically a list. Um, for us, I think it became really clear and evident to us that the schools look very different and there's a lot of needs and a lot of, um, yeah, so I'm on the bottom there. Um, a lot of specialized people in our schools now that maybe didn't exist before. Um, and you never know when they're gonna be highlighted, but for us, anything having to do with technology, our tech integrators are, I mean, schools right now would not be running, and at least my school would not be running without them and, and the incredible work they've done. So that's one example. But what I have created down here towards the bottom, um, these are teachers or positions that require, that re really our schools depend on and they require their own spaces either to at least have a, a place to hang their hat or ranging right up through to teaching and working with one student or a small group of student typically. Um, so for us, we have two academic interventionists so that each of those people really require a space. And, you know, they start out in some small spaces because space is at such a, a, such a premium in our, in our schools that um, that space in the beginning is, is you know, I, I wouldn't say a closet, but it's small rooms. Maybe they were originally intended for storage. They may even have windows for ventilation, but there's no way you're gonna get more than two kids and an adult in there and maintain a six foot social distancing and have proper ventilation. So we've had to move all these people around. Um, another example is our ELL. It's a part-time position, but nonetheless, when she is there, um, she needs a place to work with a small group of kids, usually up to like six. But when you keep in mind, under our current constraints, you know, the most we can have in a classroom right now is 12. So it still takes a pretty large space. Um, there's our tech integrator who is currently working out of, you know, it's, it's actually, he's turned it into an amazing space with the help of some grants, but he's currently working out of the, what was originally the concession stand for the gym. So when you think about it, no windows in there. And that's just kind of a place that had, that had space. Um, we have a, a speech therapist that often you know, has an office, which will work for one or two kids, but any kind of small group, it has to be in a classroom now. Uh, we also have two social workers. The other thing, and they obviously need space, but really one of the biggest things we're learning this year, one of the, I think the most taxing issues are our educational technicians are required now to, they're holding, they need a quiet place to do Zoom meetings and to be reaching into homes and working with students on their off days. And we, that has been a complete struggle to find those appropriate places for them to be doing that, especially this year. Uh, we have two school counselors, um, one school nurse that now needs two spaces. And, you know, thanks to Perry's, you know, help, we've been able to do that. We have a GT teacher that we share with Pond Cove, which needs a space. And then we also need two conference rooms. Um, then we do have the outside, you know, the providers like psych school psychologists that come in and need space. So it is a constant struggle. Um, I think when we have times like what we're going through right now, you realize how important all these positions are. And, you know, when, when everything's great, it sometimes is easy to overlook the, what they add to our buildings and what supports they give to our kids and families. So uh, I just think it's a highlight of, of how important they are. And it also demonstrates how different schools are now than they were, you know, 10, 12, 20 years ago. So. Thanks, Troy. Thanks. Jason? Okay, I'm not sure. I think you need to make him a host, Donna, or a co-host. Okay. Yeah. If he needs to share. There you go. Okay, I think, everybody see that? Yes. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Um, so, <clears throat> What I have here is, I have two lists actually. I, was, I wanted to make sure that I could answer any questions you folks have and kind of present this in a way that um, kind of meets your needs. So uh, in thinking about small workspaces at an elementary school, um, we have lots of needs at, at the elementary level for small spaces. And we, um, we definitely are, um, we struggle to find some of these spaces, particularly now in COVID, but everything that um, I kind of mentioned here, I think the need for these spaces just goes beyond um, the pandemic. Um, 
and uh, kind of describing what we have now and um, what would be in an ideal um, elementary school setting to most efficiently and effectively meet the needs of students uh, and be as flexible as possible. So this list here, yeah, I'm going to kind of go through it. It, it um, lists what we have. So you can see we have, um, we have uh, right now, you know, a little over 500 students um, and um, almost 80 staff members in the building. And in terms of a, a, a combine a copy workroom and lunch space, we have two of those. So you can see, I mean, the, the building's very, very large and um, it takes a long time to travel across. So, um, you know, so you can see already we have two spaces where staff um, would you'd even consider a lunchroom. And now with COVID, we have on that on that space, we have a sign that says max capacity two people uh, because of COVID. So, and that has to do with the square footage of the room and the ability to um, distance at six feet. So um, you can see that it's not adequate um, during the pandemic in before or after. Um, so again, you can see some of the, the spaces we have, our tech integrator has a space. Um, uh, we have four RTI teachers with two spaces so they share, um, which, um, you know, where we always, we do feel fortunate to be where we are, uh, but it would be much uh, more effect effective to not share intervention spaces when working with small children. Um, support intervention breakout rooms. Um, we have three of those. So just our kindergarten wing has one room in between every two classrooms. And so we have three of those, but as you can see, when I go up to the list above, you know, an ideal setting would be, we would have 15 of those because every two classrooms um, would share um, potentially a breakout room for um, small group work, intervention work with RTI ed techs um, or any service provider that can um, efficiently um, pull a child out for a brief intervention and then have them right back in the mainstream again quickly. Um, we have two school counselors uh, and they, they do have to each have a space now, um, but to make that happen, we need to display, we needed to displace someone else. So it, it, we have two um, rooms for our counselors, but now someone else doesn't have a room. Um, so speech, speech paths, we have two speech paths and they share a room. I'm not sh quite sure how they do it, but they just work together really well and can creatively schedule um, so that only, you know, so that they are not um, interrupting each other during their, their speech um, therapy sessions. Um, so again, not ideal there. Um, our nurse has a spot. Um, it's, it, you know, our nursing station is an internal room without a window. Um, not ideal situation for that, um, that type of um, office space. Uh, workspace with children. Our, P, our uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists have one space and they share. Uh, so lots of, um, again, um, they still do an outstanding job and they're still very effective. It takes more effort and energy to creatively, there's lots of um, things going on in the hallways in terms of um, like PT activities. And so they have to be creative because they share a space. Um, we have a behavior analyst who does have a space. Um, um, we are a um, gifted and talented teacher, services fourth grade. We have no space um, so for, that, for that, um, that teacher. So in the past, um, we have had um, our um, gifted and talented students um, travel to the middle school, and we've done other things where they're working creatively in common areas, kind of right outside the hallway instead of a classroom. Um, right now, our school psychologists technically really have no space because they were displaced. Uh, because of COVID this year, they are um, evaluating in an empty classroom. So just because of the COVID situation, because we had a classroom teacher go to fully remote, we happen to have a space that they can sign in and use. Um, but that's going to be an issue next year. We got to think creatively to have an office and a testing space for those folks two social workers um, and they do have spaces. We do have our English language learner um, teacher does have a pullout space. 
Um, it's not in an ideal location, has to walk through a room, um, someone else's room to get to her room. So kind of like funky setups a little bit, just over time, just rooms being created and added and things like that. Um, and so I won't talk about every one of these, um, but you can see right now we have approximately like 23 small work or office spaces, either um, for teachers and staff, work rooms, and for supporting students. And I'm not going to go through this all. It's very similar. But if I go up above to an ideal situation where a preferred setting to most effectively and efficiently um, service students um, at the school our size, there would be approximately 45 small spaces. Um, and that would include, um, you know, more copy work rooms for so staff can efficiently um, plan and prep with the limited time that they have. Um, it would include separate spaces for RTI teachers. It would include um, more of these bump out rooms in between classrooms for small group work with our RTI educational technicians. Um, and it would, it would certainly include um, private spaces for um, um, speech, speech paths and OT and PT, um, all things that we would really hope for, for our, our staff and our students. Um, our, we would, our gifted and talented teacher would have a space um, to, so students would not be traveling so far and taking time with transitions. Um, our psychologists um, would certainly have a space to privately test students and, and keep records and, and, um, and hang their hat. And, um, and so you can see it quickly, you know, I, I really see a need for more small workspaces, but we are certainly making do with what we have um, the best that we can. And, and I think our staff still doing a great job with the facility we have now, but um, the top, this is really, I think, ideal. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to remind people um, when we, we're talking about spaces in our schools, it's not necessarily classroom spaces. It's all of these other spaces um, um, that we, services that we are required to offer and uh, offer our students to support them. And we want to offer them, um, uh, but they're based on mandates. So just to remind everybody. Love that. Donna, do we have any concerns around um, the fact that there are probably privacy issues? I mean, are we skirting the edge here with, you know, students with health and behavioral issues being serviced? You know, the speech pathologist has to share, you know, that sort of stuff. That feels it's like a, a concern. It's a, huge, it's a huge balancing act. Yes, we are on the on the edge. I know we, we try the best we can do um, to provide confidentiality. Certainly when students are being tested, um, our teachers have to scramble around to try to find spaces. Um, if there's something that needs to be done that's confidential, um, you know, our social workers, our guidance counselors all need confidential spaces as they work with students. So um, it, is, it is a challenge. Any other questions or comments? Okay, now Heather, <laughs> back to the back to the discussion about the four options. I wanted to, as we talked about those four options, I wanted to remind um, everyone about those small spaces that are so important. I think it just lends itself to, to the fact that um, when we're talking about who's in the building and what we need in our buildings, the, the conversation is much greater than just enrollment. Yes, enrollment, enrollment is a piece of it, um, but it's not that you take a certain number of students and you divide them by 10, 15, 20, whatever the classroom sizes are, that um, there is a greater need um, for a completely different size um, in, in, in different spaces, um, and they're just utilized, um, very differently. I also want to point out, um, a lot of what we've talked about in the past and going back to what Perry said, I think you said it was $12,000 to replace that hydrant. Um, and that was 50 years old. 
um, and that that was not in the expenses um, that wasn't planned, you know, that that was something that surprised us. And um, I just remember the whack-a-mole, you know, that that's just happening more and more. And I believe Marcy had come up um, with something, I forget exactly what it is at this point, but um, Marcy had been talking about how um, the projection of those surprise needs in such old buildings, how exponentially greater they will become to pull out of our pockets. Are, am I remembering this correctly, Marcy? You're shaking your head, yes, nodding your head. Um, and, and, and so that just becomes inefficient use of funds, having a call as Perry has talked about, people in, in the middle of the night or on weekends when a pipe is leaking. And um, it, it's, it's just the, not an economically feasible way, best economic practice to move forward um, in this in this way, um, I, I I feel like this and well, I'm not going to go ahead with my opinions right now. I want to open uh, to questions, but I did want to point those few things out as part of the discussion. Um, I think it's time to open it up for a little bit with the intention. We have about 45 minutes left. I think the intention is to see if there is an option that as a group, we feel like we can narrow it down. And I think we also would like to talk about next steps. Um, maybe I will talk um, Elizabeth and Donna at this point about what our hope deadline hope is. Does that sound just to give us a time frame? Um, we're kind of hoping to have this, this committee charge is um, to bring a recommendation for a plan to the board. Um, it is not to figure out the finances of it. It is not to, um, not to get into the nitty gritties of it, but to then bring it to the board and let the board um, then decide. In order to do that, we would love to have um, a recommendation put forward, uh, hopefully by December. The, you know, so that when we start to head into our budget season, um, we can move in that direction. We've had a lot of information. We have had a lot of meetings to talk about this. I know we need to sort of recharge and remember and come back together, but I felt like we were um, making great progress in the conversation um, and just know that um, we don't want this going on and on and on. I mean, there's time. It, it's getting to be time to act and make that recommendation. So that being said, um, I'll try to notice your hands if you raise them like so, but the easiest thing is if you raise your hand, your virtual hand. Um, if you have a comment or a question that maybe we can answer. Um, Terry, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I think my recommendation, I'm not looking at that ch chart right now with the options one through four, but number four was kind of the keep replacing the tires on the car, keep roofing the building option, right? Mm -hmm. It was the security enhancements to all the schools uh, without kind of bigger picture macro level changes to the buildings, correct? Yes. Yeah, I, in my opinion, I think that one should be off the table. I think we've been doing that for decades and we're where we are because of it. Thanks, Terry. Um, why don't we talk about option four right now um, and see if others have a thought around that. Um, People are, if people are in agreement with that comment, Tara, if you want to put your hand back down, your virtual hand, and I won't call on you again. Um, and um, let's see if there's consensus that that is not enough, that as a, as a committee, we feel like that is not, here come the hands. <laughs> that should be taken off the table. I'm going to invite Jen McVeigh first and then John Volt. If you want to unmute yourself, there you go, Jen. 
Ken McVeigh, 7 Brentwood. And I'm inclined to agree with Terry that at this point, I think option four should be off the table as well. We've been doing that for far too long. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if you want to put your hand back down, John, you could speak. You could unmute yourself. There we go. I was going to concur. I, I think that the, the idea of, uh, I think the pandemic showed us um, some of where we're weak. And there are probably other places in our infrastructure that we don't even know about yet. As Colby and company talked about when they went around and sort of did the walkthrough, they haven't opened up any of the walls or doors or other things yet. And there could be m m many more things. And I think the idea you know, is like, these are uh, ending uh, buildings are getting to the end of their useful life. We've already seen um, when we're sort of running on those, those uh, close to bald tires that those can have real impacts. And so I, I think option four is, is just got to be off the table. It's just, it's like the, even knowing what we know and knowing that there's probably more we don't know. Okay. Um, thank you for that, John. Uh, I'm noticing that some people are not sure how to raise their virtual hand. Um, hope so. If you see participants, there should be on the sidebar, you should be able to raise your hand through participants. Thank you for writing that in, Hope. Um, Nicole Boucher, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. You can go ahead and unmute yourself and then Susanna Mizell Hubs. Hey, it's Boucher I'm at 14 okay. Grover Road. Um, it's totally okay. Um, so I agree with option four. I was actually messaging a friend like uh, 20 minutes ago saying, I don't understand option four. And I think from a you know the other reasons people said but also for the the risk and the amount for property owners to be paying this we know that there's going to be a cost to the schools and to ask everyone in town to you know put 20 million dollars in and like john said you open the walls trying to make you know less entrances and then you find another host of problems and then 20 million becomes 25 million and then you're sitting with this bill that's pretty close to what a, a new facility which would solve a lot of needs of the schools would be. So I just think it it's irresponsible to spend taxpayer money on option, option four. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Susanna? Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't see the option to raise my hand. So thank you for <laughs> answering me. Um, I agree. I think option four is uh, irresponsible. I'd like to know the difference, aside from the added cost of uh, portables, what's the difference between two and three? Um, but before you answer that, I, I think that, you know, looking at South Portland, what they did, you know, there's a, there's a, just a sec, just a sec, you guys, shh, shh. Um, I think, I think there's a need to take the pulse of the town, you know, and I would say go, go for the most economically beneficial option to me, which is number two, and, um, and see what the town is willing to support. South Portland, I don't, I don't want to have a rejected bond. I don't, but I have a feeling the town is gonna support option two. That's what I think. So if it, someone can answer the difference between two and three beside the added cost, because what is shown in option three, um, you know, I, I'm not sure what the difference is. So that's all I wanna say. I wonder if James is here, I think you can probably speak the most accurately about it. Are you still with us, James? I am, uh, thank you, Heather. And thank you for the question, Susanna. Um, the difference between options two and three is, Option two is a replacement of the existing lower school and middle school building over the course of four years. And it's broken down into two phases where we would systematic, it would be a systematic replacement of the existing buildings and you would get a brand new building as your end result. Um, the option three is a frame off restoration and renovation of the existing lower and middle school buildings where essentially you would take uh, the existing buildings all the way down to their stud 
Um, you would rip all the walls out. You would remove the flooring. You would remove all of the infrastructure, all of the structure, and well, you would leave just the structure, basically. Um, all basically all of the um, structural I beams and framing of the building, and you would basically start from scratch. Imagine a complete gut and renovation of um, say a home, one of the homes in the Eastern Promenade in Portland that they've been doing the last few years. This would require. Um, this would require uh, extensive portable facilities. And that's why a lot of the costs here, you'll see the cost for portables, 2 million for 12 months, 3 million for 18 months. Um, it doesn't include electricity, heat, IT, or water to these portable classrooms that students would have to be in during this time. Whereas where an option two, um, they they're believe that there is enough sufficient space to put a new building there while still phasing students within the existing building so that you wouldn't have to have portables out in the fields. Uh, and one just brief comment I'll add um, with with option four, the reason why we put this one in here was because it was one of the original options that we had pre presented in April of 2018. Um, so uh, it, it certainly, uh, given the, the situation with the last six to seven months, I don't think option four would really be uh, appropriate uh, for consideration. Um, but we felt because we had done the work and the questions were asked initially when we were hired, um, addressing security and cafetorium concerns at the lower and middle school, we wanted just to have that in there. And I'm here Thank to answer you. any questions from regarding the technical aspect of any of this stuff. Otherwise, I'll be uh, silent. Thank you, James. I, I, I don't know. I guess I couldn't read too, too carefully the um, difference between two and three. <laughs> So that, you know, that being said, um, I feel like the cost difference between a brand, two brand new buildings and two renovated buildings would might be equal or close to equal after you add in the added cost of um, portables and the other costs associated with running a portable. So my, my vote is two. Thank you. Um, okay, John Volz, your hand, is that up from before still? Okay, um, and Nicole, I think your hand might be up from before, but I see Cindy Volz, I'm gonna call on Cindy. Hi, I want to agree that yes, four should be off the table. And with option three, I even have a concern um, about the welfare of the students and the disruption to the students to have to move them to portables and have this uncertainty during the construction. I think um, options one and two definitely would provide the least disruption to the students during the process. Um, and definitely, you know, my support would be for uh, option two as well, um, in part uh, because, you know, the occupation for both schools is complete by 2024 and is least disruptive to the existing students. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Derek, you can unmute yourself. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what everybody's been talking about. I, from my mind, obviously, option four, I think, should just be off the table. I think option three should not really be considered either. Essentially, trying to reuse the structure, you're trying to, it seems like you're trying to save pennies and spending dollars to do it. Um, my opinion, I'd prefer option one or two. I like the idea of option one given kind of the uncertainty we're talking about with the um, projections in the population um, that, you know, if you build it and then you have a few years till you get to the next bond, um, that also, I think when we had talked with Matt Sturgis, he had talked about the bonding capacity of the town. Obviously we can do a lot, um, but by phasing it, you could certainly bond future phases after you've paid down some of the debt for the first project, for example. So um, the downside to that is it will cost more money to do both phases. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So doing both at the same time, kind of ripping the Band-Aid off would be less expensive than going with option one. So I'm, I'm a fan of either option one or two. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Are there any other comments? John has his hand raised again, John Volz. Just briefly um, comment with respect to option one and option two. I, I, I find them both appealing. I do have a concern about option one that you're in, in, a, sense, uh, in a sense building half a bridge um, and, and for more money. 
So I, I do have that concern, um, but I think they're both quite viable and, and, and would need much more information to have them fleshed out to really understand what the trade-offs are. Okay. Uh, so I just, um, yeah, Tim, I'm gonna let Tim Thompson speak up in a moment. Um, I just wanna, we don't, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, input on which ones they like and um, we don't have to make the decision tonight. Uh, we can have another meeting. For example, we could get down to one and two and tease that out. Um, it's sounding like option four and maybe even option three might go off the table. So I would love to focus on what we can maybe get rid of and then in a, perhaps in an upcoming meeting, sort of tease out between two others, if we can sort of keep that in our thinking. Um, so go ahead, Tim Thompson, just for time's sake. You can unmute yourself, Tim, and you can have the floor. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this, the, the four options open. I don't think I can keep that open and confuse my video, but the, uh, my, my question keeps coming back to what we can afford. And, and when I hear people wanting to take option three off, because there's, it's like, I think somebody said it was pennies different than option one and option two, it's $20 million different. Um, you know, so if, if we can get two of our buildings, taking them down, I think James mentioned, it's like somebody renovating a, a beautiful building downtown taking it down to the studs and getting us a couple of nice buildings. And the downside is we got to use portables for a period of time, but it's $20 million. If, if I'm looking at this right, it's somewhere between 53 and 58, as opposed to 71 to 77. That's not pennies. And again, we do have to come up with a project we're going to be able to afford as a town. I don't know if anything's been looking at the video of our last meeting. You know, I, I brought the point up and I hate to be bringing it up again tonight, but it's something that, you know, based on the feedback from our town manager, what can we afford um, as a town to borrow? Um, and whether we do it in a phase like phase one and phase two um, and spread that over a 10 year period of time to make it affordable. Um, I just, I, 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 I guess I need some more information as to how, how we're gonna be able to borrow $77 million and, now, I don't know if Derek's on the call tonight or not, but I'm wondering if he could give us also some input based on, on the pandemic, the cost of materials has increased so significantly. Um, could we get some kind of an update on this, these estimates? Because from what I understand, just a two by, the cost of a two by four is, is a, a lot more expensive than it was six months ago. Yeah. Um... Thank you, Tim. I, I'm going to call on Elizabeth Cypress. I Go ahead. Thanks. So I'm going to stick to the conversation at hand for the moment, which is just around um, option four. I believe it should be off the table. I think it would be incredibly irresponsible and a very poor choice and a very poor use of money to keep option four. And um, because I take notes and I'm a careful listener, I just need to correct Mr. Thompson, who I do respect deeply. Um, the speaker said that we would be saving pennies by spending a lot of dollars, not that it was a pennies difference in doing option three. We would be essentially spending a lot of money to save a little. And if you look at portables, but um, I just wanted to clear that up. So I wanted to be careful about what people were saying. Thank you for that. Um, the other thing that I just want to clarify um, about how much we can borrow, and I don't have the information specifically in front of me, but um, we have the capacity to borrow this much money. Somebody please, a board member who's been involved in this, if, if you want to speak up and help out with this. We have the ability to, to, um, to borrow more money. If we wanted to keep our A plus rating, that number is much smaller, but we are capable of going down to an A minus rating or a B plus rating and borrow the money needed to do these. So it is possible and seeing Elizabeth shake her head, our finance chair, do you have anything to add to that to clarify what I said or did that explain it? I really don't. I feel like 
you know, outside of this meeting, because that's really not the purpose of our meeting, as you just said. I, you know, we, we can get some advice, especially around, you know, phasing and that sort of thing and having, um, you know, kind of an, an impact that would be the most palatable, palatable as possible to the town. But um, we are historically incredibly under leveraged. And so maintaining an A plus rating is not necessarily the goal of, of this committee and nor should it necessarily be the goal of the town if we are not, you know, if we don't have the facilities that we need. Mm -hmm. um okay so i would like to um just... has her hand up. oh i'm sorry go ahead marian thank you i couldn't find the raise your hand button on yes, this... I'm... <laughs> um just a couple of points i wanted to make option three the difference between a new building and renovating the existing buildings I think one factor that we need to really think about is the environmental responsibility. It's not just the 20 million uh, difference in price, but also there's a growing recognition nationally that renovation is almost always more environmentally responsible than putting uh, the building materials of an old building into a landfill. So. I would hate to see us uh, eliminate option three because it may well be the most environmental, most environmentally responsible way to go um, going forward. And, and I would just add, I agree with Tim Thompson that $20 million is not an insignificant amount of money, particularly when you, I recall that the town manager last December talked about the borrowing capacity and I realized there's a limit by uh, state law, but that limit is ridiculously uh, large and you would never borrow at that limit. I think that ultimately my guess is the town council is going to want to look carefully at what the manager and what Moody's and others say is the reasonable place to be. So I um, would not at this point be uh, shrugging off a $20 million difference in um, the cost of a project. But, I, but again, more importantly, I think uh, option number three is perhaps the most environmentally responsible option for this town. Okay, thank you. I see... Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see Phil Saucier and then Hope Straw and then DJ Nelson, please. Um, can I just stop for one second and, and speak to the chat box? Um, I do see that there's some conversation happening in it. I cannot really take the time and focus and listen to what's happening with people. Um, if we were all together, we wouldn't have a chat box on the side. So. I would really appreciate it for, for everybody's sake if you have something that you want to be typing into the chat box, if you maybe share it with everybody or, um, you know, that so that some don't receive the information and others don't. I, I get it when um, somebody is sharing a link, um, that would be great. Um, so please speak instead of chat, thank you. Uh, so then Phil, Hope, and then DJ, go ahead. Phil. Yeah, thank you. I'm just, <clears throat> I just wanted to weigh in on the option four, which I think um, uh, should not be considered going forward. I think it's irresponsible. I agree with everyone speaking till now. I would, I was just going to make the suggestion that, I mean, given the timing tonight, and it has been a number of months since we've all revisited this, that, um, you know, I'd like us to see us, uh, there's a lot more discussion I can see that needs to be had on options one, two, and even three. I have an opinion about that but I don't think we have the time to decide those three tonight. And I'd like to carry those on to another meeting, but I, I think we can, and maybe we need to even vote, but I think we could take option four off the table. It's not sufficient. It doesn't address any of the needs our administrators and our, and our principals have, have spoken about. Um, and it's too much money. I mean, that's what I keep on coming back to. It's too much money. Um, it's, um, it's up to $29 million um, for something that doesn't address anything really um, other than two, two items. So. That's where I am on that. I'd, um, and then I would, 
I have a lot to say about the money and the debt, um, but I think I'm going to I'm going to pause because I, that's not I think for us tonight or even maybe for this committee, um, it will be a discussion um, going forward. That's it for now. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Hope, go ahead. Hi. Um, so sort of uh, similar to what Phil was saying, uh, as a as a school board member, I feel like we're here to to listen to the committee. So I don't want to express an opinion specifically, but I think we're not here, uh, we're not the finance experts, it's up to the town council to make, you know, the ultimate decision about the bonding. Um, we're not, you know, we didn't, con we, we paid for an enrollment study, we have the information, but it's not, it's not sort of the gating factor as to what we do. As a committee, we're, we're parents, we're teachers, we're administrators, we're town people, and we're looking at, I think we have the information we need to look at these four options and say, like Phil said, I think we could probably eliminate one tonight if we voted, it could be very simple. Um, and then it's up to us to say, you know, maybe we need one other one other meeting to, to go through the remaining options. But I really want us to try to avoid, you know, we, we keep going down these sort of different paths of details that aren't really the, what's before us. As a committee, what's before us is option one, two, three, or four, and then and then move on from there. Thank you, Ho. Uh, DJ. Uh, I may be saying more of the same, but I, you know, I, I do agree that uh, I would, I would think that option four could come off the list, and a future meeting could focus on on the three remaining options. And I, you know, I don't really. It's hard to separate the finance uh, component from the reality of, of you know, seventy mil, up to seventy million versus fifty million, or you know, th it's hard to sort of separate that and say this is a recommendation. Um, I, I do think you know for future consideration, if we were to look at these three, uh, understanding more about the environmental impacts. Um, and, I, and I'd say, you know, new construction does afford you some uh, ability to have a higher level of environmental uh, components, uh, you know, that go into a building. I also agree that, you know, removing uh, materials and, and potentially, uh, you know, putting them in a landfill has a different type of environmental impact. But I think if that's a discussion, and that's certainly one of the, the goals here, to be environmentally friendly that I think we should have you know more discussion about that and then my last comment is one other you know if by renovation um, renovation can have a, a certain set of benefits um, but I think again separating uh, operating costs is another factor here where uh, a, a renovation may make a building uh, less environmentally friendly in, in the new you know what you put back into it than a new construction might and then, and there's you know operating costs that go along with that. That again go back into the finance. It's just hard to be able to separate uh, both of those without um, without having more information on sort of operations and what really would be the environmental conditions. Thank you, DJ. Uh, Cindy Volts has her hand up. Is this a new comment, Cindy? Yes, I did have one other comment I wanted to make about option three. I realized these options were put together pre-pandemic. And um, the use of the portables in our current climate and you know, even in the upcoming years could potentially be a consideration. So if looking into option three, I think we'd want to, to look into the safety of usage of portables as a temporary classroom, particularly after we're investing, we know we're investing now in the short term in the ventilation in our existing buildings. So to move students out of them in the short term for renovations into portables, we're kind of canceling out some of that investment we're making in ventilation today. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I'm not seeing other people want to comment. I I think I think it's okay to talk about option four and the possibility of deleting. I'm not sure, Donna, unless you can figure something else out, how to vote with everybody here because it's kind of. Um, I guess you could just raise your hand. A show of hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know some people had a hard time showing their hands. Um, so I'm gonna sort of pose out there to scratch and take off option four. So if you agree with that, um, I'm okay. I'm seeing some hands raised. I'm seeing administrators not participate and my, um, So I guess I'd love to ask administrators, wait, can we pause for a second? <laughs> I feel like administrators may not speaking up 
to either side because I've had conversations and I've heard administrators say in the past that um, it's hard to weigh in one way or the other when it's taxpayers and Cape Elizabeth, their money. So I guess I just would like to know um, to the administrators here, if you do plan to vote or not, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, I just don't want to make, I just don't want to assume you're one way or not raising of the hand or not. So does that make sense? And I, I think it's completely, okay. Yeah. So Peter's saying no, I, and I think it's completely reasonable and I can understand that. Yeah. I see Jason shaking his head no. Uh, Troy saying no. I'm not sure where Jeff lies. I mean, I'm I'm happy and to I, again. Jeff is a is a taxpayer, so he might want to vote. I mean, so I, you're going to plan to vote? Well, I'm happy to say what I think, but I just I've never viewed myself as a member of this committee. I've always thought that I'm a information right. provider and not a member of the committee. If I'm a, that's that was my understanding of my status in this group, and okay. I'm. Pretty, and I'm very comfortable with that status. Okay, so in that sense, you probably won't vote then with that status. Okay, all right. So I just wanted to be clear from my perspective on that. Let's go back and, and try this again. Heather, People may I interrupt really quickly? Yes. There's a voting opportunity. If you click on participants, the same way you would raise your hand, there's a yes, there's a no. Oh. Oh. Yes, I see that. I don't know if that would be just easier for you. Yeah, yeah. Does everybody see if you click on participants, you can press oh, yes. Over like Aaron the... Taylor just did. Thank okay. you, Aaron. Oh, I see more, I see more, I see more. It's over on the right, the yes and no box. Under the guests, under the um, participants names that come up when you click participants, it says yes or no. And so I know that some people might be having a hard time based on their device. So I'll give you a chance to speak up. So Heather, can you ask the question again? The question is if you are in, agree in agreement of taking off option four as an option. Um, and then if there, so that means we would just go down to option one, two, and three. Um, is there anybody who has not weighed in to vote because they can't find the yes, no. And if that's the case and you wanna speak up, speak up right now. I wanna make sure that technology is not getting in the way. Okay, so I see one, two, oh, James is not voting, two, um, okay, so it is not unanimous, but it is pretty uh, across the board to take off number three as an option. Number so four. I, I, I'm sorry, thank you, thank you, sorry. Um, so I think we will do that. So we've narrowed it down to option one, two, and three. Um, and we have a little bit of time left. Um, I agree. I think that there, there's not enough time to even come close to having the appropriate discussion for option B. What we need to do is come up with next steps. So what, what would people need in order for this discussion to have on one, two, and three? Can we talk about that? May I ask if Colby Company could in, um, so on option three, they give an estimate of 53 to 58, but then there are all these asterisks that saying it doesn't include the cost of portables. It doesn't include the cost of this and that. Is there a way, because as we, as we start talking about this, some people are, I mean, we're, some, we're all gonna be somewhat driven by cost rather, you know, there are lots of other considerations, but there needs to be a way to do a better comparison, if you know what I mean, because it, it seems like, you know, it looks like it's a $20 million difference when it probably really isn't. And so I, there, is there a way to get all those asterisks into the estimate? Go ahead, James. Absolutely. 
Um, so to to answer your question uh, as straightforward as I can, no, um, because there are very uncontrolled variables that we really can't track at this point. What we've used to base our costs on for um, portable rentals are past recent jobs that we've had and are trying to... Uh, no, um, no rental company that we spoke to will give us a cost for what is going to be three years from now. Um, we, we use this construction escalation. Um, and Derek, I, your, your cost estimate with Zaka, you could probably speak to this better than I can. But what we're doing is we use a lot of predicting factors to anticipate what costs are going to be in the future. And especially with, I'll say how not necessarily turbulent, but how busy the economy was leading all the way up through COVID and even continuing beyond, um, just construction in general has just been very, very rapid. Uh, and the cost of material as well as the cost of labor itself just to try and find qualified workers has been very, um, it's been very challenging the last year or so. And the cost for, um, the portables, um, the temporary structure, I believe that cost was captured in that 58 million or 59 billion that was in the uh, option three um, when that slide was up uh, previously. The, the challenge is with, uh, with option three is that you have, um, you're still maintaining, I'll say an efficient, an inefficient building. Um, it's a, it's a, it was, a building that was built in the 30s that has been constructed on all the has been added on to since then all the way until the 2000s where your elements are attacking each side of the building it's also attacking from underneath into your slab and when you have that thin of a slab you can't necessarily replace that i know that wasn't directly answering your question but i wanted just to throw that that piece out there as far as just you can replace mostly everything but you can't necessarily replace um the slab of your of your building does that answer your question it doesn't that but it is something that I would definitely ask about next time. Um, we'll have to we'll just have to remember that and we'll look at the slide again because I didn't think that the cost of portables was a part of it. I'm pretty sure it was one of the asterisks that said it wasn't along with you know electricity and water and heat and all the uh, other stuff. And I, I just feel like when we're having this conversation, I think it's going to be really important to not make inaccurate comparisons. You're absolutely right. Um, and I'll say that you are correct. Yes. Uh, the asterisks regarding IT, water, heating, electricity, all to those portables, that is not calculated because it's not possible to be calculated at this point. Um, what we did include was the general cost to rent the portables. That was that two or three, two and three million dollar figure you saw there. So it does say rental costs not included in estimated bond size. For it, rental costs of the portables, um, we're estimating that between two and three million. Whether that, I'll say whether that is included or not included, that's why we're providing the range of the fifth, the mid fifties to high fifties on this. It's a very, it's a very wide.